Toronto Indo-Chinese Women's Conference took place in April 1971. Women from Canada and the United States met with Indo-Chinese women to strategically collaborate on how to persuade the U.S. government to end the Vietnam War. The conference coincided with peace talks between the North Vietnam and the U.S. governments taking, in, taking place in Paris. Three of the organizers of the conference, Maureen Hines, Carolyn Egan, and Nancy Reynolds, spoke to Rise Up about the events leading up to the conference and the conduct of the conference itself. Can we start with very brief introductions from each of mm -hmm. you? Um, like just what your names are and where you're from, maybe. <laughs> um, I, and I'm Nancy Reynolds. Um, I was involved in the events we're going to be discussing. Um, and I live now in, I was living in uh, Toronto. I live now in Hawaii. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Egan, and uh, I live now in Toronto. And I was quite new to the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement uh, when all this took place. So I'm Maureen Hines. I'm from Toronto. I was a member of the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement, probably from, if not its start, the very earliest days. So I was part of the organizing for the Indo-Chinese Women's Conference in 1971. Thank you. Okay, so we're thinking about 1970-71 when we're, when you're all beginning to think about planning this Indo-Chinese Conference, Women's Conference. So could you start by describing for us the political context of the time? Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I think really to understand the Indo-Chinese Women's Conference, it was really, really important to understand the political context because it was a time of tremendous radicalization, political struggle it was happening. I mean, a few years earlier, uh, students and workers in, in France almost took down the government there. And uh, around the world, there were national liberation struggles happening everywhere throughout Africa, Palestine, Ireland. And of course, there was the war in Vietnam. And uh, the strongest uh, imperialist power in the world was throwing all its military might at a small Asian nation that was involved in a liberation struggle. And uh, there was huge devastation, hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese killed, carpet bombing of the uh, North Vietnam, of uh, Hanoi, and uh, a, a very significant international anti-war movement developed probably in every country around the world. And uh, this was hugely, hugely important, and it was a, a point of struggle for so many. And uh, we, we were, of course, a part of that. But also all kinds of other struggles were taking place in that era, you know, the late 60s into the 70s. And uh, you know, the, the Black Power Movement, the Women's Liberation Movement, the Gay Liberation Movement, the American Indian Movement. And uh, these movements, people were really questioning the very system we were living under, fighting racism, of course, oppression of all sorts. And uh, it, uh, it was radicalizing many, many, many people, particularly young people, but, but way beyond young. And uh, I, I think that uh, in that process, uh, Certainly in the United States, revolutionary organizations like the Black Panther Party and the Iwakun, which was a uh, Asian American organization, the uh, Young Lords, which is a Hispanic organization, they all viewed themselves to be uh, revolutionary socialists. And, uh, and uh, this was extraordinarily important and uh, I think was having a real political impact. And of course, when people are fighting in this way, I mean, the US government did not want to lose that war and they surely didn't want revolutionary forces within their own country. And so whenever that happens, there's repression, very real repression. And we saw it here in Canada uh, with the uh, October crisis, and I won't go into detail, but the War Measures Act uh, was uh, put in place uh, because uh, of the actions of separatists in Quebec. Uh, a cabinet minister was, uh, was taken hostage, he later died, and a UK envoy as well. And uh, the War Measures Act took away all civil liberties. It was in place just before we were in the organizing and through the process of this conference. And uh, it uh, allowed uh, searching of premises without warrant. It allowed people to be arrested without charge, to be jailed without charge. And I think almost 500 trade unions, political activists, uh, nationalists were jailed. And uh, anyone who was seen to be supportive of, of, of the separatist movement, the FLQ. So 
that was taking place here and in the United States at the same time, there was incredible repression, the murder by police of, of black activists. Uh, Angela Davis was in prison in uh, on Trump's up charge in California, Erica Huggins, another Panther in, in New Haven. Uh, Jackson State students were killed, black students were killed by cops in an anti-racist demo and Kent State, four students were murdered by the National Guard, others wounded. Um, and uh, people like Fred Hampton who was an organizer, young, 21 years of age, killed because uh, he was trying to build a multiracial uh, coalition. He called it the uh, a rainbow coalition, foreshadowing others that came later. Uh, of, uh, of, 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 of black people, Hispanic people, white working class people, and uh, he was seen to be a real danger. And so he was murdered. And uh, his close associate who was in the apartment at the time or had just left was a police informant. So this was really the context in which we were living. I mean, tens of thousands of American um, war resistors, draft uh, uh, resistors, uh, deserters came to Canada and uh, it was an extraordinary time. And even our own office, our headquarters, if you want to call it that, was in Praxis, a political organization, a house they had rented on Huron uh, here in the downtown Toronto. And it was ransacked and, uh, and uh, burnt, uh, you know, destroyed. And so this was, this was the, the, the world we were living in at the time. We were extremely young. And uh, it was at that, uh, in that context that we were asked to organize a conference of uh, Vietnamese women and Laotian women to meet with uh, counterparts who shared common uh, common cause, anti-imperialist women, including the organizations that I, I mentioned earlier uh, at a conference here in Toronto. And so we did. Um, yes, that was great, Carolyn. Thank you. That's really painted the picture. Um, and how, how soon we forget, eh? Um, okay, so next question is, uh, so what were the origins of this conference? How did you get, well, first of all, how did you hear about it? How did you get involved in organizing it? Um, and, and we'll go from there. So the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement was approached by the Voice of Women. I don't remember which person and who, but anyway, we were approached um, to um, co-sponsor or organize a, a joint, not joint together conference, but a second conference that would follow the conference that the Voice of Women was having. And um, they were also working with um, some organizations in the United States, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and the Women's Strike for Peace. And um, so, so the Voice of Women, a non-governmental anti-war, nuclear disarmament, social justice organization, um, had also been meeting in Budapest um, the year before with Indo-Chinese women who asked if, and, and, and the Voice of Women had done this before, organized a conference in Canada um, for them to come to speak, uh, well, I guess different Indo-Chinese women, but anyway, for, for, for them to come and speak in Canada. But they, the Indo-Chinese women in particular, asked if they could have um, a conference with old friends, and that would mean the Voice of Women, Women's Strike for Peace, um, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, um, and um, new friends. And they saw those as um, women's liberation movement members or activists, and especially um, women's liberation movement members from the US, because of course that was the center of the empire. That's who they wanted to impact and, and you know embolden. And also they wanted to meet with the term they used at that time was third world women. We probably say women of color now, but um, that, that's they, they wanted to meet with women of color in organized groups. So um, from the start, the voice of women had been, you know, concerned about the, vo the war in Vietnam. They were, you know, concerned and happy to move this forward and help set up joint conference. So we started organizing in October of 1970. I have my day books from, from that era. And so I have all the meetings and who attended them and where they were, sort of. That's a bit sketchy because um, I, of course, wasn't keeping this for, for posterity. Um, but anyway, we began in October 1970. And um, um, one of the things that I had to do was, um, and, and I went with two or three other women from Toronto, and I can't remember who, but we went to Baltimore. First, we went to Baltimore, and we went to New York and met with women in the American women's movement there, women's liberation movement, and um, 
So they they were on board. Um, I actually don't remember the concrete details of the meetings, but they were excited, they were pleased, they were anxious to be part of this and, and very enthusiastic. And they got busy organizing. So, um, you know, in terms of what we um, organized, um, you know, um, I, you know, just, I don't know who, somebody asked us, I raised my hand, and then at meetings, I asked other people, and they raised their hands, and so we had a small collective of five or six or seven people, and um, we started doing the, um, doing the, the organizing. From the start, we knew that um, the predominant number of attendees should be American women. And so I think we, we planned for there to be 100 Canadian women and 300 American women. And so, so that's why we start, you know, started the liaison. I think you've gone over how did you get involved mm -hmm. and where you told us that you were part of Women's Liberation. We're all three of you part of Women's Liberation. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was an actual organization, the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement. Yeah. And would you like to know what collectives we had? We had, it was a very broad-based, multi-pronged organization. Um, I, I had this list in the back of my notebook, too. We had an abortion collective, daycare collective, a course collective, internal education collective, a clinic collective, a small discussion group, political struggle group. <laughs> I don't know what we did there. Marxist study group, working women group, um, a coordinating committee, the Quebec group, the office and newsletter group, the Vietnamese women's conference group, and um, the library and literature group. And we also, I, I think one of your questions was, was there any other group involved? And yes, the, the Leela Khaled Collective was involved in Rising Up Angry or Red Morning. And um, they took on the particular task of cooking the food for the conference. And if I may, the political struggle, uh, the political yeah. struggle committee was what we uh, had been the coordinating committee, and we turned to change the name to political struggle, and it's where we met uh, all the different collectives, met with representatives or maybe everyone, and we uh -huh. would figure out our priorities and what we were going to do, and uh, and uh, politically struggled our way through it, I guess. So you must have had a lot of women to have all those collectives. It's a big group. It was a big well, group. Was a, you know, yeah. I, remember, I remember the meeting that Carolyn volunteered and she mm -hmm. was, there was standing room only in one of the yeah. big um, uh, rooms at Hart House and Carolyn was standing by the door and waved mm -hmm. her hand and said she'd like to be, you know, uh, so there were like 40 or 50 people there, women there. You know, that was a real banner year, 1970. It was... Um, it's amazing. I mean, the, all the number of collectives that, that Maureen mentioned, and then the actions that we took on were quite um, comprehensive before we agreed to do this. We had, we had outreach to groups in the U.S. already. Um, there was uh, mostly around reproductive rights, which is the area that I was most concerned with. And the... Um, Chicago Women's Liberation Union um, had approached us and we had some ongoing contact with them. There were groups around Canada. And I think that um, the whole, the process of getting involved in the abortion caravan, which Toronto didn't initiate, but we played a major role in its culmination in Ottawa and um, really basically disrupting the House of Commons um, with uh, you know, demands for free abortion on demand. And it was a, a huge success in a lot of ways, and it had ongoing impact. So we had a sense of agency about our, our ability to carry things out successfully. And at the same time, the growing um, conflict within Quebec and our um, sense that people were fighting there for the right to self-determination um, made us concerned but feel sort of helpless about being able to, to do anything. And once in October, the um, War Measures Act was invoked and there could be you know, arrest and detention without trial and clearly a very um, broad uh, view was taken of who, who was um, uh, needed to be arrested. It, it was a difficult time. So, and then on top of that, like, like me, um, I was the wife of a draft resistor. And we'd been politically active against the war in the U.S. and immigrated 
1968. And there were quite a few women like me in the women's liberation movement in Toronto. And I think, I, you know, reading Pedestal, I think there were some in Vancouver as well. And we had a great interest in um, being able to support the struggle, but we were in Canada. And it was, this was a time when there was growing, um, you know, organized momentum in the US to end the war. So I think we were, you know, we had lots of reasons, um, Quebec, the, the um, draft resistors desire to, to make a difference and our successful um, actions to date, the fact that we were able to cooperate with other groups and bring things off successfully that um, were pretty iffy at first, made us want to take this on. And it was really, um, you know, I remember the meeting where we debated um, the pros and cons of doing this. And I don't think we recognized how much work it was going to be, but I don't think we would have changed our minds even if we'd known because it was a way to participate in something meaningfully and to support struggles that we really cared about. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was an effect to the April 30th. I mean, they, you know, they, they, um, it, it was transported into what is it, the Public Order Act, temporary measures, but it was, that was an effect throughout this whole planning process and you know, throughout the conference, it was a reality. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and, and the other thing was the RCMP was anxious to do surveillance of these conferences in Toronto and Vancouver because of the War Measures Act, I think. So they didn't want Americans coming up fomenting revolution. They saw it that way. Well, actually, Nancy, you talked a bit about um, um, the discussion about taking it on. Maybe you could mm -hmm. elaborate that a bit and explain why. Um, you know, what the debate was. And, 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 uh, yeah. I think it was really, did we have the resources to do it because we knew it meant building, it meant keeping people, people safe. But I think at the time it was really sort of the idea of, of you know, finding the place to put it on and this just the work of, of um, you know, I'm sure that I don't remember exactly what we did with fundraising, but I know that that would have been, um, you know, we were, we were impecunious young women in our early 20s. And I think most of us had kind of, uh, low paying jobs or were university students. So it, that would have um, been it. But I don't recall, you know, I really have a very clear recollection of it being kind of, you know, uh, there, there weren't any passionate, um, you know, like we, sh we shouldn't do this. No. Um, we have other priorities, uh, nothing like that. And, uh, you know, reading Pedestal, um, clearly in Vancouver, there was a lot more um, debate about whether this was even worth doing that. And I know we did not do that. I mean, I really think we were looking for, for this kind of opportunity as, as a group of people, but also we were, you know, we, we were pretty large um, in, in the organization at the time had lots of members. I remember quite a few meetings at Hart House with, you know, if you get there late, you have to sit on the edge of a desk or stand out, you know, like and peer over people's shoulders. Um, so it, it was pretty, it, we felt strong, I guess, is that probably yeah. yeah. I think that's really true. And uh, I was very new to the uh, Toronto Women's Liberation Movement. Uh, I don't know if that was my first meeting, but it was one of the earlier ones. And uh, I, I think uh, in my memory is there was no real debate. I mean, there were obviously questions and things of that nature when Maureen put it forward. But I think as Nancy is saying, by far and by large, we saw this as, as frankly, our political responsibility it was hugely, hugely important. And the point of the conference uh, it was to bring Indo-Chinese women from Vietnam and Laos who were involved in armed struggle with the United States government to meet with uh, uh, women from the United States, self-defined anti-imperialist women. And we were asked to do a regulated conference in the sense that it would be uh, not open to everyone. It would be registration and pr primarily to bring American and uh, Indo-Chinese women together to, uh, to, uh, to discuss their commonalities and how to build a uh, a, a broader anti-war movement because the Paris peace talks were on at this mo at that moment and uh, uh, Vietnam obviously the Vietnamese wanted to win the strongest possible uh, deal out of that and uh, a strong anti-war movement was critical to that so we we felt that uh, it was a, a conference that we were pleased to organize but it wasn't wasn't a conference for ourselves it was a conference yeah. very very much for the American women. Uh, many of whom, as I say, were in, uh, you know, self-defined revolutionary organizations, uh, organizations of color, and the Vietnamese women, and we would do everything we could to facilitate it. We weren't having 
huge expectations in terms of what our own uh, needs were as a political organization or anything of that nature. We, we saw this as a, a hugely important task where there was a lot to win, a lot to lose. And uh, it was our part in playing a role in the international anti-war movement in a very particular way. Well, it wasn't true in Vancouver. There wasn't that no, kind of consensus around, this was a, a, a conference for American women and for Indo-Chinese women, and we were facilitating that. It wasn't, yeah. I don't think that was the understanding and in Vancouver. The idea was that Canadian women were attending as, as attendees. The idea was that they were there so that they could help do whatever was necessary to support the purpose of the conference, not there uh -huh. to, they weren't there to, to um, to to um, instruct anyone in their uh, you know in, in the particular cause that they had and you know I I never felt that that was that was the purpose of it at all and I don't remember having conversations with Canadian women that suggested um, at least the ones you know coming to Toronto that suggested they were um, that they felt the purpose of the conference was to benefit Canadian women in some political way it yeah. was. We were, we were facilitators, we were, we were yeah. hosts. So the, the war was between the United States and the Vietnamese people. <laughs> and to be able to have people, women who were actively involved in that liberation struggle from Laos and Vietnam come to Canada because they could not go to the United States, obviously, and to yeah. allow American women who are actively involved in, in very serious politics in their own country, building in their own country, to have that ability to come together it was really important and it was a it was a very in our view a very important political task to take on and and as nancy said quite a few of us were american uh, who who came up through the you know the draft resistance movement and one of the reasons why the organizing got started so late like october for a, you know a conference the following year early in the year um, was because um, the voice of women were not sure they were going to be able to get visas for these women to come to Canada, and there was a big holdup. And um, so, anyway, that 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 was you know October was when they they were sure they had the visas. We could go ahead and start organizing. So what did what did you do? What steps did you take? How many? You obviously had a little, oh, not a little, probably not so little, but a a group of women that were concentrated. Yes. Little. Little. Okay. Okay. <laughs> little group. It was, I, I have a list, a list of about six women that, that, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we drew in more people, but I mean, it was organizing a conference. So we had to do the ordinary things that you do in a conference, you know, well, first of all, we were liaising with the voice of women and liaising with the, the women in the United States. We organized a court, a cultural night at, um, so the voice of women had their conference for the first three um, two and a half, three days, and we had ours for the second. Um, so we, or we organized a cultural night at St. Lawrence Hall to start the conference, and there was music, there were speakers. We, we invited Margaret Atwood. We, she invited us to her house, and we planned out with her what she was going to do. You were there. Do. All of us weren't. <laughs> a little crew. Oh, but yeah. A little crew was there. I don't know who else came. Um, so yeah, we had to organize billeting 300 US women. So we called on every single friend that we had, not just the women in the, in the movement. We had to organize um, a registration process and uh, you know get the list of American women attending and cross check it with their ID at the door, a regulated conference, as Carolyn said. We organized security not just at Castle Frank School, which we had had to book, but, um, but you know, everywhere trying to keep the Indo-Chinese women safe. And you know, we were aware of surveillance happening during the conference, people were being followed, people were being photographed. My friends, um, Julie and Tom, um, billeted some young lords and they found um, people taking um, videos or, or movies outside their apartment building. Um, th so there was a great deal of surveillance. And, you know, just typical conference planning, you know, we booked the Castle Frank High School, we booked the auditorium, we booked the cafeteria for food, we booked classrooms for sessions, we made sure there were projectors and lights at the high school, we made sure the kitchen was available to us for cooking. Um, I have a note about um, make sure that, that we can use the staff room as a, a medical room if we need to. And then the final evening, um, the Voice of Women organized a small 
gathering at the friend's house, um, the Quaker's friend's house in, uh, in Toronto, um, to just bring the organizers together and with the Indo-Chinese women who were very grateful and very pleased with how the conference went, as we recall. And so our, our impression and our recollection is that the conference was pretty smooth. And, you know, when we read these horror stories from Vancouver, it's like, whoa. Anyway, I mean, there was some contention. There, the, the, there was the very first morning, there, there was a, a statement that had been read at the Vancouver conference, which happened before ours, um, about um, lesbian women stand up and, you know, and, um, you know, put forward their, their issues. Um, and that, that just happened. And then we moved on. Whereas it seemed to be a big struggle throughout for, for um, the women in Vancouver. So yeah. that's... I'll talk a little bit about outreach that we tried to do. I mean, recognizing oh, yeah. that the majority of the women who were going to be there were from the United States, many of them from communities of color. And uh, we were from a fairly large organization, as uh, we outlined earlier. So just about everyone, I think, involved in our organization was taking part in the meeting, a lot as organizers, security, all of that. And uh, the Leela Khaled Collective, Rising Up Angry or Red Morning, whatever its name was at that particular time, people who saw themselves to be anti-imperialist of the new left, I would suppose. But we also recognized that it was important to go beyond ourselves. And we uh, tried to uh, involve women from uh, communities of color here. Uh, we did know women, uh, Asian Canadian women who were at the University of Toronto and connected with them and the numbers of them came to the conference. We, I remember going uh, to a meeting at the uh, Great Wall Bookstore, which was uh, a bookstore on Spadina in uh, Chinatown there, and which was uh, run by, uh, by people, Chinese, who were people who were uh, very supportive of the Chinese uh, revolution. And we spoke to them about the conference and if there were women who would like to attend, et cetera, and there were. And we also uh, were able to connect uh, with uh, Caribbean Canadian women who we had not uh, known before, at least I had not known before. And uh, there were a number of meetings. I remember over at a, a apartment on Bathurst Street, north of Bloor, uh, over a store, a number of meetings there connecting with women about what the plans were. I think they were a little skeptical at first because we, we, we seem so young. <laughs> you guys are doing this conference, are you? And, uh, and, 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 and what was going on that Indo-Chinese women were coming, women were coming up from the United States and all that. But uh, beyond that level of uh, skepticism, could this really be pulled off? Uh, numbers of women uh, did attend. And there was one woman in particular we worked with quite closely, but th those, those, uh, those, uh, those meetings took place. So we tried to uh, be as inclusive as we could be at, uh, you know, at, at that particular juncture. Uh, and that probably is, if we had the 100 women who were Canadian, that's probably what made up that 100 women. Uh, I, I, I don't see that it would be much beyond that. But I know that there was certain interest uh, to, to, to connect with the, uh, the, the women from Vietnam and Laos. But I think there was also a very real interest uh, to connect with the women from the Black Panthers, from the Wakun, from the Young Lords. That was uh, something that was uh, very, very important as well. And, and people may or may not know, but groups like the Young Panthers, they were well over half women. The, the, you know, one, one doesn't always know that in terms of their membership. And, uh, and the fact that, that they were making the effort to come up here and uh, you know, you not always using their own ID. I mean, there was a real, uh, there, there was, a, you know, they were under, as we mentioned before, incredible repression in the United States. Some flew an awful lot drove up, and uh, you know, we had to stop uh, media from taking uh, videos of all the uh, all the cars in the Castle Frank uh, school parking lot. Though obviously, if there was going to be. Uh, uh, surveillance, which we know there was, uh, those would be obvious, but we tried to do what we what we could to uh, to make people feel as safe as possible uh, in uh, what could have been extremely difficult circumstances. And uh, as, as Maureen or Nancy said, you know, someone who I think had young lords in the car was the attempt to run off the road. And uh, there was a, a guy who came in a car, and we couldn't determine his accent, whether it was American or Canadian, who uh, wanted access to the conference uh, to, to see what was going on, which we refused, of course. We don't know where, where he was from. 
Uh, and uh, one interesting thing which someone read in one of the accounts was, and this is amusing in some senses, that the security was so tight that they didn't have anyone in the conference as an informant. And whether that be true or not, maybe the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement was not a group that they felt was important earlier than that to infiltrate, perhaps. I don't know. But uh, I'll just interrupt to say the source of that is this book. Um, here we go. The, yeah, just watch us. Um, where there are uh, these people, um, um, Christabel Sefna and Steve Hewitt, um, got access to um, 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 RCMP files through access to information and protection of privacy. And um, this is what they, I mean, they supposedly, they had a ton of informants at the Vancouver conference and they have much fewer, many fewer um, reports on the Van uh, Toronto conference for them to draw on in terms of, you know, getting some information about surveillance of that movement, our movement. Um, and, um, yeah, so they 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 said that the security at the Toronto conference was too tight for them to try to infiltrate, and so they didn't. Who's to say? I mean, it, it was it was quite funny because I mean, when we think, I mean, I was one of the heads of security, and what I mean, we were barely in our twenties. You know, some people weren't probably even, but we we did everything we could, and uh, the young lords, women came up, but some of their male comrades came up as well. And uh, they did not take part in the conference. Um, and I don't know if they had intended to or not, but they, they did not, but they were on premises. And uh, I'll, I'll just tell a little bit about how we tried to organize the security. And people have to remember, there were no cell phones. I mean, yeah. we didn't even have faxes in those days. I mean- No it, email. It was, <laughs> no email. I mean, it was extraordinary when you <laughs> see fax. But what we did do is we, 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 you know, we obviously went through the premises earlier and we had an understanding of where the entrance doors were, et cetera. And everyone came through the front door and uh, went through a process. And Nancy can explain that of being checked in and frisked, I guess, because we were concerned about weapons and other things coming in. And we had, uh, we had women who were in the security detail uh, at every entrance and, uh, and we had shifts on that. And we also had a method just in case something happened because gosh only knows something could is if something does happen at one entrance, yell to the next person over to the next and not have everyone rush to that area and leave the rest of the, uh, mm. the, the premises uh, what, unguarded, if I may say it that way. And there was only one time, aside from the, the guy who looked like he was whatever, some type of a, uh, security kind of person. The only other incident that was of significance that I remember is that there were a number of women who had not registered for the conference and to my mind had never even been in touch with us uh, regarding the conference who went around to the side door. They may have tried to get in the front door. I'm not quite sure. They went around to a side door where we did have security and uh, they knocked on the door, whatever. And I think whoever was there did open it to see what they wanted. There were maybe a half dozen, maybe more. And uh, they then tried to push their way in. And this sort of set off the alarm system of yells that we, we, we had in place. And I remember running down and some of the young Lord uh, uh, men who had been sitting in classroom talking, maybe playing cards or whatever, they leapt up, of course, because they were, oh my God, what is happening here? Rushed out and there was a, a like a maintenance closet there, opened the maintenance closet and came out with uh, uh, mop handles, uh, broom handles, because literally it was the only thing they could get their hands on because in their minds, they thought it was under attack potentially by the RCMP or some uh, you know federal uh, security force of some sort. And, uh, and then we got there and we got there just before the young Lords got there. And we realized it was, you know, a group of feminists who had not registered and wanted access. And we explained to them that it was a conference that what we was asked to be regulated. Security was very concerned, but it was a very major concern. And one had to have pretty pre-registered and they wouldn't budge. And so to the credit of the young Lord guys, they let us handle it, though they were right there with their broomsticks still in hand. And we just had to sort of push them out, the other women, because uh, I, they, they really, at that moment, as my memory tells me, couldn't really explain why they wanted to be in there, except they wanted to be in there and were feeling excluded. But we, on the other hand, had to prioritize the agreement we had made with the, with the Vietnamese women, the Laotian women, and the American women, particularly mm -hmm. the women from the communities of color, that this would be 
as the term was, a regulated conference where their security and their who they were and all of that would be really respected. And we had no idea who these women were. So anyway, that was the only incident that I remember where our security really had to uh, uh, make, a, uh, make a determination. And oddly enough, it worked very smoothly. And uh, uh, to uh, it may, it maybe it wouldn't have been another circumstance, but it did. And, and I remember nothing other uh, untoward that sort of happened through that conference. I always love remembering um, a Black Panther woman saying, just sort of largely to a crowd, that Carolyn Egan, she's an amazing security, that Canadian security is good here. It was just like, whoa, well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but she singled out Carolyn, it was great. Well, I think I was the first one on, on the scene. <laughs> Well, you were head of security. Yeah, I was head of security. Like yeah, we we were we were concerned about people infiltrating with something that could be used as a weapon. Yeah, yeah. And this is, I mean, these were paranoid times for good reason. <laughs> but um, <laughs> as it, what as it happened, we you know we found the job. Um, the those of us who were doing the security detail would um, be in place when people started to come into the conference. And most of the women from the Black Panthers then that I recall had their hair was natural. It was they used hair picks, um, fairly um, you know large ones to um, for for grooming. And we had made a decision, and I don't know whose decision it was. It was not mine, but it, it did sort of make sense when you went to, you saw these hair picks um, that that if you know if we were going to take away um, white women's um, you know, Swiss Army knives. We should be, you know, doing something like this with, um, you know, we should be looking at anything that could be used as a weapon and and just apply that across the board. And the what was amazing to me was that there were some people who who seemed um, kind of disgruntled by having to do this, but nobody, um, you know, absolutely resisted or was, um, you know, rude or unpleasant about it. It was something that that people. Um, you know, thought over and then thought, this is not, this is not what this is about, where it's not worth um, making it an issue. And so it wasn't an issue. It was um, something that we were doing to keep people safe. And whether or not um, that was absolutely essential, you know, if something, if, if someone had been hurt, um, <laughs> that would have been bad. So I, <sighs> The, um, the process of security in Toronto seems to have been something much more peaceful than I guess happened in Vancouver. I'm not sure um, if they were doing frisking to the same extent. I just think that um, what, was, what was done in Toronto was much more, um, I guess it, 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 was, it went more smoothly. Can you tell me about the conference itself and what role the um... Um, Indo-Chinese women played in the conference during the conference. So we had that cultural night at St. Lawrence Hall. It was, you know, progressive entertainment to welcome everyone. Um, there were plenary sessions on Saturday and Sunday um, where the Indo-Chinese women were at the front on the on the stage and their interpreters, and they talked about their lives and they, you know, and the horrific experiences that they had gone through. One woman had walked three months to get to Hanoi in order to get on a flight to come to Canada. And uh, another woman, um, you know, were, another woman, you know, her entire family, um, both parents, two sisters, grandfather killed, seven children. Um, so, um, so, you know, we were learning about their lives and about the devastation that was occurring to Vietnam and also the poisoning, you know, with the, um, all the um, chemicals. Agent Orange, um, yeah. Agent Orange and napalm that was you know, being spread across the countryside. And their history, how long they'd been involved in the fight and how their families were involved in the fight against imperialism. So, so those were part of the plenary sessions, that kind of information. It was, you know, extraordinarily moving. Um, as organizers, we didn't get, I didn't anyway, get to go to the breakout sessions. And I don't really recall specifically what, this, what the breakout sessions were about. I mean, besides, you know, I don't know, perhaps there was meeting with one woman or two women and, you know, we're just meeting with Laos. I, I don't remember with, with the Laotian women. I don't remember what the content was. Um, so the breakout sessions happened. And then 
Um, and then, as, as I said before, there was a social evening at the, on the last night of the conference at, at the friend's house. So um, yeah, the, the plenary sessions were pretty um, moving and pretty, um, I don't know, pretty smooth. There was no kind of disruption at them. And um, at, at, we can recall, you know, in the Toronto Telegram, there was apparently an article that there was fist fights that occurred at the Toronto conference, and none of us have any memory. And we, we would remember the that. At the door. It was probably just the question at the door when oh, yeah. people tried to come in. You probably yeah. that. That was you, Carolyn. <laughs> that was me. Yeah. Right. yeah. I was taking taekwondo at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, you know, so the women were just talking mostly about their lives and one woman was an obstetrician and gynecologist and uh, you know that we, we just learned about their lives and and the struggle and what they yeah. hoped for and they were very clear about what they wanted from us was you know to to keep pressing our governments um to to end the war to get the u.s to withdraw and let let the indo-chinese people determine their own future in their lives. That's right. And there was a big, I don't remember, it was probably in Canada too, but I know there was a huge anti-war mobilization uh, plan for the end of April in the United yes. States. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of talk about building that as strongly and broadly as possible. And as Maureen said, uh, you know, press for uh, immediate and complete withdrawal of American troops. And mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that was sort of the, the political message uh, that uh, was coming through beyond, uh, you know, all of the other uh, other discussions that uh, that did take place. You know, Dr. Hiem, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. It was X I E M. She was um, made a huge impression on me. You know, as as doing doing the um, sort of the gopher jobs that most of us ended up doing because there there was a great need for the the host to be, you know, doing all of the um, main, maintaining the process um i didn't get to hear all of any particular plenary i did get to hear dr jim um describe the um the environmental devastation of the war um and just year after year after year and i don't think i really um you know made the connection between the environmental um calamity of the Vietnam War and just, just the extent of it, the, the you know, wells that were, were poisoned, the children who with napalm burns, um, the uh, women miscarrying, um, like and as well as just what was what was happening to the countryside. I found that um, extremely moving and difficult to um, imagine, but it, it it's one of the uh, memories I have that started me, my interest in um, just looking at environmental issues as, as fundamentally political issues as well. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a point I thought that she made very effectively. I think that people listened very closely. I, you know, I would be, um, I remember having to leave the sessions in order to do something. We have, you know, someone would come and whisper, can you do this? Or do you know where so-and-so is? And then that, that would be, the end of it. We were really, um, you know, at at um, the disposal of the whatever was needed to make sure things ran smoothly. So um, that's, you know, if I could have changed anything, it would have a little bit more time to 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 hear people. But it, it was what we had to do in order to make it work. We have this little pin that they gave us, and but I, I think the the beef. The, the ring made from a, uh, a downed B-52 bomber, uh, I think, uh, really gives the impact on what we were dealing with and why I think so many of us there, American or Canadian, appreciated the incredible enormity of the, uh, yeah. of, of the conference and what we, we were dealing with. Uh, as I said before, so much to be won and lost here. Yeah. I wore that ring for years. Do you think the conference was a success? You sound like you think it was. Oh, I would say it was a tremendous success. And I, I think that, uh, I mean, uh, speaking recently to my partner at the time, the words were, it was a grand success. And it was a huge amount of work. 
and a lot of uh, a lot a lot a lot of being out of the the house and and just uh, <laughs> doing all that had to be done it, it, there is no doubt about that it took a huge chunk out of uh, people's lives but i think really it was we we saw it as a hugely important political uh, political task i don't think there's anything uh, any anyone who was involved who would probably uh, uh, disagree with that and i think the interaction would be uh, with the American women, again, because we were so busy, we didn't have a tremendous amount of time, but I remember for whatever reason, much more the interaction with the, with the Panthers and the, and the Young Lords and the Iwakun than the uh, white American women. I don't know why that is, but uh, it may just be my memories. And as it turned out, I happened to know just not all that well, but I did know one of the women from the Young Lords from New York, just which was a, a pleasant uh, coming together again. But uh, I, I surely think they felt it was hugely worth their while to come. And it's a long, I mean, just from New York City, you're talking about 10, 12 hours and people who came from further away from that. And I think some from Atlanta actually came up and Philadelphia and it's a long drive for sure. And in very, uh, in very uh, difficult times. And would they have trouble getting back over the border again? I mean, yeah. you, you didn't need passports at that time, of course, but uh, uh, getting into Canada was one thing, and then going back to the United States was another. And the United, the, the American border people were pretty uh, uh, strict at that time because so many deserters and resistors had come up. And for the deserters, for sure, and for many of the resistors, you know, there there were warrants out for the, these guys, you know, and uh, there was a lot of surveillance going back in. So I, I think there was there was certainly worry about that, but. Um, the feedback certainly that, that, that I got that this was hugely important for them to take part in. And they were very much interested in building uh, solidarity and uh, building uh, you know connection with other anti-imperialist women because uh, the fight that we were all involved in more so in the United States perhaps than Canada, but nonetheless uh, was something that they needed as many allies as possible. And, and that was surely the feeling that uh, that we were given as, as they were leaving. And they were leaving, uh, many of them driving all night, you know, to get back to from whence they came. And it was uh, it was tough. And as, as Nancy said earlier, I mean, these weren't luxurious accommodations. Most of us were in very <laughs> low paying jobs, et cetera. I mean, Maureen and I, we were working in the same uh, place at that particular point. And I think we were Office, probably yeah. not making much more than minimum wage. And obviously where we were putting people up and we tried to give the best accommodation possible, but it surely wasn't uh, all that comfortable. Uh, though I think people were used to that at that time, of course, but it, it, uh, it, it in our view, and I think in the participants view uh, uh, who had come up from the US, it was well worth it and it worked without too many snags. And I think as you were saying, Maureen, the um, women from Vietnam and Laos, when we had that gathering uh, was, uh, you know, they, they were extremely gracious, extremely uh, happy that had taken place and, and thought it was uh, politically important. And I should say the voice of women, you know, like Kay McPherson and uh, who had been involved in the voice of women for a long time and, uh, and Moira Arma, you know, a lesbian feminist and, uh, and Nancy Pocock with, with, with the friends. I mean, they were, significantly older than us and uh and uh but again we're extremely gracious i mean we may have had differences here or there but there there, there, there was not a sectarian uh edge to the organizing in my memory of it anyway i mean i i'm maybe women who didn't feel they had access mm -hmm. to it or women who didn't feel they got to attend it you know they may have uh, you know had feelings of that nature but it was never brought to our attention in the sense of uh beforehand or after that I remember anyway, in our, in our evaluation meetings, which uh, I don't think any of us had any real notes of at this moment, maybe you did Maureen, but uh, I, um, I think, but yeah, go ahead. Why, why was there two separate conferences? Why one? Well, I think one of them was the regulated conference that was to be specifically for anti-imperialist women and particularly the women from the States. And I think the other one was a voice of women um, more older women, perhaps. I think it was more open. I, I could be wrong, but I think anyone could have attended that. And uh, there was also an evening event that they did at OISE, which was open to anyone. So I think it was two different audiences. And the Vietnamese women had- but It was what yeah. it was what the Vietnamese women had asked for. for you know, yeah. 
conference with the old yep. friends, conference with yep. the new friends, and conference with the third third world yeah. women. And, so, and, and were there other, the, uh, in terms of the American women visiting, yeah. was it mainly the Young Panthers, the Young York Lords? And what was that other group you called? Yeah, it? Ewok Ewok Ewok, which was Asian American, but there were also white anti-imperialist women as they defined themselves, yeah. yeah. There were, yeah. Okay. There were many, many, you know, women of color. They they played a, a significant yes. role in the in the uh, in the conference, and the agenda was really set in the United States. Am I wrong yeah. on that? I think that we no, did. No, that's have, that's true. Yeah. yeah, and so it was the American women and how they did that and who was involved in setting the agenda. Uh, we we don't really know, but uh, it uh, it was set there, and uh, yeah, and so uh, ho hopefully there was agreement between all the different women or among all the different women who were coming up about what that agenda would look like. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm now down to the question about how would are there any things you would have done differently? Yes, um, and I wouldn't have been able to answer this question this way before um, this opportunity arose to um, to discuss the IWC in Toronto. And what I would have done differently, and now I really wish we had done this differently, was be to document it um, much more thoroughly and effectively. I think one of, there are three Ourselves. books that I've come across. I mean, you know, pu published by university presses, by academics now that are, um, that deal with the IWCs. And they, um, they almost invariably assumed the Toronto conference was, uh, was a, um, a reflection of the Vancouver conference and they were vastly different. And so what we considered um, at the time and still do a success has, has gone down in some um, academic writing as not, um, a, as basically a, a, a reflection of Vancouver. It conflated they, the they two, document, yeah. They documented very effectively what they were um, what they were doing, and there, it was more contentious. So there's more points of view um, in their documentation about whether things worked well or didn't, or what should have been done or wasn't done. They um, had um, a skit which um, all, apparently it's been transcribed completely in in their documentation, and um, it seemed. Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of, of data there for academics to look at if they're interested in, in covering what happened. So yes, I think people should have, um, you know, we should have been aware of that. We were very young. We were not mostly, you know, headed for um, academic careers. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like central in, in planning and carrying it out. And I think we just neglected to do that. And in, you know, trying to augment my memory, um, mm -hmm of what happened, the more I found online about, um, about the conference, um, the more perplexed I was. For example, an interview with Naomi Weistein, who's a well-known um, you know, American psychologist. She died in 2015, but she um, was recorded in one of these books as saying she had um, been denied the opportunity to have her band perform. She had a women's band from Chicago um, because they were white, I think was the reason. And that was the night we had the event at um, the, on St. Lawrence Hall Lawrence. Um, with Margaret Atwood, which was definitely planned. And Maureen, Maureen just described, you know, the planning meeting for that. And, you know, so these, you know, if, if you don't document your history, someone else just might, you know, come in and do it for you. So I think that's, that's really my only regret. Yeah, I wish I had just sat down for, you know, a couple of hours and written out my experiences, like not even my evaluation, but just a list of what, yeah. what happened. Um, but, but yeah, so then what ends up happening is, um, so for example, in this book, the document, you know, what is what becomes a, a kind of um, record um, is, is that of informants to the RCMP saying what happened through their lens, trying to make whoever's paying them happy in terms of, of you know, what they report and what they observed. So we have people sort of outside the movement documenting it and not ourselves. So, huh? Yeah, I, I think it, it bespeaks uh, the fact uh, our youth and as Nancy said, none of us we were saw ourselves heading into academic careers. We were just doing what we were doing and uh, you know, trying to be good political activists. And we did it. It worked. It worked well. And uh, all right, on to the next task. So on to the next thing, yeah. ours. And I mean, my own feeling, too, is that 
uh, I would have loved to have been able to keep connections with, with some of those uh, Panther women and uh, young lords and Iwakun women. But again, mm -hmm. I mean, they came for a purpose, that purpose got accomplished, and they were back in extremely heavy struggles within their own communities. And uh, and if, if we lived in a different world, if there was a email and internet and all of these things, mm -hmm. you know, then it could have been very, very different, but it wasn't. It wasn't that time. And we had phone conversations, but we were so conscious of every phone conversation essentially being taped by the RCMP mm -hmm. or someone. And I, I, people may find this hard to believe today, but that we were so conscious of security simply because people, you know, here and there were being jailed, were being tailed. There were informants everywhere. And uh, not to be paranoid, as someone might think so, but that's not that was the reality so sadly uh that that would have been something that would have been uh you know very good to be able to do and uh and uh you know sadly we we, we weren't able to you know uh, ontario was uh, right next to quebec and you know british columbia is long thousands of miles away right. and i think that that could account for some of the difference in the in the atmosphere and also in how seriously we took certain mm -hmm. tasks yes fair enough yeah. Because we, we yeah, had a Quebec collective in the Toronto Women's Liberation yes, Movement. Right. And yeah. we were very, I mean, you know, we were, uh, Liba and people were actually translating documents right right from Quebec into English. And we had a very real connection with what was going on. And uh, as you said, Sue, you you yourself were arrested. I mean, people were very, very involved in uh, in uh, in doing all we could to be supportive of of of, uh, of uh, political activists in Quebec, and so and you're right. So we had perhaps a different reality. Yeah. So I'd like to ask how the conference helped to build anti-imperialist feminism, if it did. Well, what we felt when we looked at that question is we felt that we were anti-imperialist feminists. I mean, that was the uh, that was part of the politic of the Toronto Women's Liberation Movement. And, uh, and so we obviously saw ourselves as a part of that current and a part of, a, of, of a current of an international, you know, anti-war movement. And we wanted to create a uh, connection, solidarity, support for struggles of all sort around the world. You know, we were fighting for women's liberation, mm -hmm. but we didn't see that as the only struggle. And we were very, very conscious yeah. of fighting, uh, you know, against the profound racism that existed and, uh, and, and in support of, uh, of national liberation struggles and, and all of, of, of those questions. So I think that if a stronger anti-imperialist women's movement came out of this conference, if it, if it helped in the United States build a stronger consciousness of, uh, of what imperialism was and, and why it has to be fought, then that was, that was great. I don't think it was the purpose of our doing it. The purpose was to bring you know, as we said before, the Indo-Chinese women and the American women who were self-conscious revolutionaries and saw themselves as part of an anti-imperialist movement together. And, uh, and that experience hopefully, uh, uh, you know, would, would broaden that, that, that viewpoint because uh, I, I think we all felt, and that was the common cause of everyone who was at that conference at least, that we felt, uh, you know, there had to be, as they say today, real system change, you know, it, it, you know the system that, was, was, that we were all living under, uh, bred racism and sexism and homophobia and all of that and uh, and it, it had to be changed dramatically because imperialism was a part of it and so that was our goal surely but this conference wasn't that if, if you get the nuance there uh, we we had a very immediate goal of, of facilitating the dialogue between those those two groups of women and linking the struggles and linking yeah. the struggles very much so uh -huh. yeah. which was the objective wasn't it yeah yeah to link this and also and also to um you know i mean just to recognize that ultimately i mean we played a very small part tiny teeny part but but we won you know that's that's you know the war the war you know, the war well, did end one of the best victories we've had yeah i think so and, they you know, really and that i think really shapes your whole political consciousness for the rest of your life because mm -hmm. um I think, I mean, I don't know, people can speak for themselves, but when you know you have been part of a huge international collective struggle, and of course it was the Vietnamese people who defeated the, the US militarily, but that huge anti-war movement and all the interrelated struggles, as people said, that were part and parcel of what was happening then, it gives you a sense that 
you do have the capacity through collective change to really make a difference. And, you know, when the, when the, you know, you hear the slogans, uh, uh, they are few and we are many, which, you know, can become sort of meaningless if, it, if it's used uh, without uh, a context, but it's true. It is true. And we had the experience and certainly my involvement in the women's movement uh, as time went on and certainly in the reproductive uh, justice struggle, the abortion rights struggle, that's when we and many of us who got involved in that in, you know, in the early 80s and prior to that too, but as Nancy was saying, the abortion caravan, but in 83, the whole Morgan Thaler campaign to overturn the law, we knew it was going to be a long drawn out struggle. And yet we had the confidence if we could organize people, if we couldn't organize, if there was no residence, if those people wouldn't come into the streets, if, if people wouldn't do it, then we may not. But once we saw that was happening, we felt we could win. And so I think that that understanding of, uh, of the power of uh, of, of, uh, of collective change is, it, you know, it does stay with you and it gives you confidence and uh, hopefully makes you optimistic about the possibilities. Mm -hmm. That's we had achievable goals. We set achievable goals and we set, we had a plan. We did not set a goal that, that we were not, that was not in our power to achieve or not achieve. I mean, you know, so we've sure. set our sights on something that was doable, that was needed that and we did it and that that fact i think did, you know we we felt a sense of agency and a sense of success mm -hmm. that is that's the kind of thing you can carry into your next project your next struggle and mm -hmm. we were able to do that because i think we, we were realistic in our ambitions but we also you know once we committed to it we we really did we really um made sure that it happened and even in a supporting role, which was our role, to be able to do that and, and at the time we were doing it and the way we were doing it, given who we were and what we were dealing with, I think it just amounts to a huge success. Yes. And, you know, and Maureen said, you know, it was one conference, you know, on a weekend in Toronto, Ontario. But you know what? If you feel that there are similar, not quite like this, but activities, actions, whatever, worldwide, that's what builds a movement, right? And uh, mm -hmm. and so our conference played that role, but we knew there were many, 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 many others, uh, untold numbers of other things happening uh, all over that uh, that uh, that would help build, you know. And as Maureen said, and uh, it, uh, it the, the U.S. withdrew. The U.S. lost that war. Mm -hmm. Um, just a little aside here. Mm -hmm. um, any of the of the sort of political strategic differences come up? Like you probably remember that there was sort of a big uh, bring the troops back home lobby that went on in the uh, in the US versus those of us that were anti imperialists who mm -hmm. were saying, you know, really fighting for a VLF victory. Yeah. Did mm -hmm. any of that come out in the conference? I don't know if it came I out. I think it was a starting ground yeah. for us. You know, yeah. we called ourselves anti imperialists. That's who we were. It was sort of, um, I don't know, it. it you know, if there was any division, it was around uh, issues of sexuality that people thought should be, be, you know, have much more play. But, you know, in terms of that, in terms of the ultimate goal, and people understood, you know, the, the depredations that imperialism and colonialism bring, and they wanted an end to that. Of course, the American people were suffering terribly too. And, you know, there was a recognition of that, but it, it wasn't framed as bring the boys back home. It was framed as we are anti-imperialists. Yeah. I think two things were going on at the same time. I, I think we were anti-imperialist feminists and that was part of our worldview. I mean, we were informed by, you know, Marxism, as many of the organizations who came up were, uh, you know, one sort of another, one strand of another. But I think at the same time, we also appreciated there had to be a broad anti-war movement out there with people like the Voice of Women, like with people like, uh, you know, United Church types and mm -hmm. all of that to build a broad movement. So yes, that huge mobilization that was going to take place at the end of April was important that everybody from every sector be out. But it was also important that uh, those of us who did have an anti-imperialist perspective uh, be part of that and be able to, uh, you know, make, make it clear why we feel that as important as ending this war is, it's not going to bring liberation to everyone worldwide, you know. And, uh, and so I, I think the two things were sort of going on at once. But, but this was 
yes, an anti-imperialist conference in the sense that the, that was the politic of the women who were taking part in it. And I think that's what uh, the Vietnamese women, why they wanted the two conferences. Why they wanted to meet yeah. the new friends. They wanted yeah. the, 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 the broader the conference and they wanted this one. You know, the role of the draft was very important in the um, to the um, women of color from the U.S. because they were often um, partnered with or, you know, sisters, daughters of people who were um, draftees. And they, um, their struggle for, you know, would not be over just by bringing them home because they had yeah. the, the home struggle was going on at the same time as the, the, the domestic anti-imperialist struggle in the U.S. And so, you know, it was never as narrow as, as you know, um, ending the, just ending the draft or bringing people home. It was, right. there was so much about the draft that, that pointed up the um, inequities in the, in the United States um, for men. And it was, you know, it really made no sense to narrow it, um, even if, if we hadn't been anti-imperialist to begin with you know, to, to narrow the focus that much. The focus was on, there are so many struggles going on at the same time domestically. And I think that was, you know, in part what the, um, the, the Vietnamese wanted to do too. It was, it was a two-way um, communication uh, and recognizing that there was a struggle going on simultaneously in the U.S. Um, and in Indochina was, um, was part of the, the function, I guess, of bringing these people together. And so, yeah, it was, a, it was always a broader, um, broader brush in terms of, you know, what, what the goal was, the end goal. It was a huge goal, but it was, um, it, it made no sense to have a, a smaller one because, you know, nothing is gonna change if you, <laughs> if you can't change the things we were trying to change. Yes, that's well said. And I, I think yeah. we did see ourselves as part of a revolutionary movement for change with very many uh, different manifestations in, in different places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this was 50 years ago, as you say. 49. Yes. 49. <laughs> yeah. um, and so most people that probably look at our website now would never even have heard of this. True. Um, what do you think is the most interesting thing about it for people to know? If we were writing a, a blurb on this for social media, what would you tell them? Well, I think it's a lot of what we've already been discussing, you know, around um, we were part of a broad movement that achieved a very important goal of ending a war, you know, that we, we won that, that particular battle. Um, long and protracted as it was. I, I think that is really the most important thing. And and how, you know, as Carolyn was saying, how empowering it is to take it on and and how it leaves a residue of hopefulness and optimism that that we can accomplish our political goals because we are so surrounded, like just looking at what's happening in the US right now with Trumpism. We're surrounded by really a lot of despair. And that was similar then you know it was it, we 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 were just deploring the u.s government um and our own government's complicity i hasten to add um so yeah it's it's i think that's one of the most important things that that people can can learn can glean from these small conferences these demonstrations these organizations the the breadth of all of those things and what what they can lead to yeah, and I think also is what uh, young people can accomplish because we were kids. Right? Yeah, we were kids. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you if you look at you know what's going on in the climate justice movement today, and uh, I, I think many of the the leadership of Black Lives Matter in many areas are quite mm -hmm. young, and uh, uh, young people have a capacity of organizing uh, and and developing the confidence and the skills to be able to really be politically active in a way that makes a, a huge, huge difference. I mean, you know, when you look at Fred Hampton, he was 21 years old when they murdered him because he was yeah. being so, so successful in building a political project that would really shake the foundations of, uh, of, of US capitalism, I may put it that way, because 
he appreciated what needed to be done and he was doing it and he was effective. And so I, I think that uh, people should not be deterred and uh, you know, uh, determined to do something, as Nancy said, that you actually have achievable goals. So you can, you can set out to, uh, to either overturn a law or win a strike or, or whatever it might be, or defund police, whatever your, your issue might be, and, and then build a movement to make that happen. And you're not gonna win every battle, that's for sure. And, uh, and uh, perseverance. I think perseverance is, is absolutely critical. But if you look historically at movements that have won and uh, who is involved, ordinary people involved, you know, and, and, and really understanding uh, they are trying to divide Lula, they're trying to do everything possible to derail, you know, a progressive agenda, a revolutionary agenda as we surely felt we had at that time. And uh, we just have to keep that up and keep that up and keep that up. And hopefully, you know, we'll get to that better world as we build the smaller struggles that will, we'll, uh, you know, potentially one of them may just burst into flames and really spark something really, really, really broad. Yeah. Great. Thank you.